So welcome everyone to the uh, TCS seminar at Jagiellonian. Uh, today we have uh, Shandor Kishpaludi back from uh, Alto University. Uh, Shandor uh, previously worked in uh, ETH Zurich in Max Planck Institute. Uh, he does uh, research on approximation algorithms, uh, and more recently also in computational geometry, and in particular uh, in hyperbolic uh, computational geometry, where we also have some joint project happening now. And uh, today he will tell us on geometric variants of the traveling salesman problem. So please. Okay, thanks, thanks, Bartosz. So uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, the talk that I have today for you it's more of um, of a problem setting talk than a problem solving talk. So I, I hope that you will enjoy it and maybe get some inspiration for for interesting things to look at for the future. So that would be the primary goal. Um, so before I get to the talk, I actually want to uh, thank uh, all my co-authors. So, I mean, I will mention several papers and this is the union of, uh, of all the co-authors uh, on those papers. Um, and so roughly the plan uh, for today is to start with a quick uh, complexity introduction. Um, uh, I believe that uh, I will be able to do this very quickly for, for this audience. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, Euclidean traveling salesmen. And here I will mostly concentrate on the lower bound side uh, because uh, I think that <clears throat> some of the techniques there uh, would be you know, generally applicable and they are not, not as well known. So I, I hope that uh, you will find that interesting. It's also maybe more interesting for from the combinatorial or, or uh, graph theoretical perspective. Um, and once I, I do all that, this, this will be really about uh, like classical uh, Euclidean traveling salesman. Then I want to switch to this, um, um, this new uh, type of problem uh, that uh, I had in my abstract where we are visiting uh, not points, but some, some other types of objects. And uh, there are a lot of still uh, unsolved problems there. And uh, I, will, I will mention also some, uh, some early results in the area. OK, so that is the, the rough plan. And uh, let, me, let me quickly do this complexity introduction. So we all know and love uh, the satisfiability problem and three satisfiability in particular, where we are looking uh, to decide if there is an um, assignment of uh, true and false values. Uh, to these xi uh, variables in a formula such as phi here. Um, of course, you can you can brute force uh, solve uh, such a formula. There are also better algorithms. Uh, like I, th I think this is currently the best known for three satisfiability. Um, and as we know, like uh, the exponent here is still linear in n. Um, so we, we seem to be stuck there for decades now not being able to improve uh, significantly the exponent like to something a little off and would be really nice. A related problem would be maximum satisfiability so or maximum free satisfiability again I have a formula of the same type with the m clauses and uh, I want to satisfy as many clauses as I can. Uh, and if you think about it uh, doing a random assignment will satisfy uh, about seven over eight times m clauses, because uh, you know with a random assignment each literal has uh, one half chance of becoming false. So in order to make a close false, you you have like a one over eight chance. Uh, one over eight chance. Um, so so getting like seven over eight times m clauses satisfied is is, is fairly easy. Like uh, you can you can do even a, a randomized argument there. But uh, getting uh, something slightly better uh, is a famous result of Hustad is unlikely to happen unless p is equal to NP. So like these problems are really at the core of um, our you know practical understanding of complexity. These tend to be like at the bottom of all those reduction trees that we make. Um, they are really well studied and uh, they really extend this view of complexity. So instead of looking at, uh, you know, P versus NP hardness, we could, we could try to 
uh, try to say like uh, something more interesting about uh, hardness, like uh, distinguishing running times such as two to the order n or two to the order square root n, and doing something similar also in the approximation realm. So we, we want to we want to have this more fine-grained view of complexity where we can distinguish like an n squared from an n cube and uh, two to the order n from an order n factorial, for example. Um, uh, there's also stuff in between, um, like this this space. I hope gets populated in my lifetime. This this white space. Um, so this is for you know exact algorithms. Uh, if you involve parameters, uh, you know you can you can draw similar diagrams. But in order to to make such lower bounds, we actually need something better than p not equal to n p. So I mean, many of you will probably be familiar with uh, the exponential time hypothesis. So instead of saying that 3SAT is unlikely to have a polynomial algorithm, we're saying something stronger, that 3SAT is unlikely to have an algorithm with running time 2 to the little o of n. And if you are brave, then you can, you can assume even stronger things like strong ETH. So basically saying that satisfiability is not going to have a 2 minus epsilon to the power n algorithm for any positive epsilon. Um, or uh, if you're into approximation, OK, so here I'm oversimplifying slightly. But basically, what you're saying is that maximum satisfiability, you're not going to be able to approximate uh, to some factor less than one uh, in time that is to, uh, well, sub exponential in n, so like two to the little o of n. And, uh, you know, you may or may not believe uh, these hypotheses, but uh, they certainly. Um, Mm, certainly, it certainly seems to be true that, that when you, you think about a problem uh, and you come up with a lower bound based on one of these, um, well, those those bounds never seem to cross. So at least so far, these uh, these hypotheses are are standing. Um, okay, uh, so th this is basically uh, just to say that I will be using ETH and gap ETH to, to justify to justify lower bounds in this talk. But just know that every lower bound is uh, that I will talk about is conditional on one of these two things. OK, so that was just a quick introduction. And now I actually want to talk about uh, the problem, Euclidean traveling salesman. So um, well, traveling salesman really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, in general, I have an edge weighted graph and I want to find the minimum cost cycle that contains each vertex exactly once. For example, uh, this would be the solution here. Um, now the Euclidean variant, uh, I just have endpoints in the dimensional Euclidean space and I want to find the shortest round trip that visits all of these points, uh, which would be this one here. So of course this is uh, like really a special case of the general one. Like you can you can put the Euclidean distances on the edges. Um, so what do we know about the complexity of these problems? Well, quite a lot now actually. Um, so general TSP, it has been shown NP complete among the first NP complete problems. Really, um, we have. Um, well, you can you can just enumerate all all cycles. Uh, it will be very slow, embarrassingly slow. Uh, there is a better algorithm, this uh, famous Heldkart and Bellman dynamic programming, which will reduce the running time to something like uh, two to the power of n times some polynomial. Um, and uh, when you specialize to the Euclidean setting, then we still have uh, NP hardness. Actually, it's still open whether the problem is contained in NP. So like first open problem of the talk. <laughs> um, but uh, we know since the 70s that it is NP hard. And we have some algorithms. So uh, we have like a two to the order square root and algorithm for the planar case. And uh, when the dimension uh, D is larger, you can still do something uh, significantly better than two to the N. So when the dimension is three, then you can get uh, like two to the order N to the power of two third. And uh, then dimension four would be uh, exponent three over four and so on. So it gets progressively worse, but uh, you know it's still still better than two to the n. Um, and okay, so what about approximation? Uh, well, general TSP you cannot really approximate the way I defined it, uh, whereas Euclidean TSP uh, is is much nicer. You can do a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time for any fixed positive epsilon. So this was 
kind of the view that we had of, of these problems. Um, well, okay, not quite. I mean, this is more recent, these algorithms, but still this, this was the view. Um, but when you look through the, the lower bound lens, it seems that we, we are really uh, in quite a good place already. We actually know that uh, you cannot significantly improve these running times under the exponential time hypothesis, at least these, these exact algorithms. There is no two to the little of n algorithm for the general version. And you also cannot beat um, the geometric version for any dimension d, unless the exponential time hypothesis fails. Right? So, you know, in a way, this, these running times are settled under ETH and up to constant factors in these exponents. Um, okay. Um, so a little bit more about the approximation question. Um, so approximation schemes for Euclidean TSP. Uh, the question, this was actually one of the, the big questions in the 90s to, to try to find um, for any fixed positive epsilon, a one plus epsilon approximate tour in polynomial time, where here the polynomial would of course depend on epsilon. And uh, so Aurora and Mitchell came up with the first such algorithms. Uh, I put here the running times for dimension two. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, these running times, uh, they were then, um, okay, so so I mean, they, they achieved this polynomial time approximation scheme, but then, then uh, you know, we wanted to improve these running times and uh, there were two improvements already. So one was by Rao and Smith. So they, they achieved an efficient PTAS where the running time is of the form some function of epsilon times a polynomial in N. And uh, there was also this uh, other paper uh, in Fox uh, 13 by Bartel and Gottlieb. Uh, they managed to get rid of this log N term, uh, but uh, they paid the cost in the, the dependence on one over epsilon actually. And also I have to say that in order to get rid of this log N, you, you kind of have to extend the, the model of computation you are working in. So uh, this there is actually an N log N lower bound in, in a certain model. So, so you, need, you need some chicory and you of course need some, some new ideas to get rid of the log N. And uh, so what we did here is we, um, we got a running time of two to the power order one over epsilon times n log n, which is uh, well strictly better than the first three. We cannot directly compare to Bartel and Gottlieb because we have this log n factor. But uh, of course, the epsilon dependence is strictly better. It's also also an efficient PTAS, and and what is nice about this algorithm is that it is um, the algorithm itself is relatively simple. It is based on a modification of Aurora's algorithm, which is the simplest of the bunch. Uh, and actually people people even teach this, uh, this uh, the Aurora's algorithm often. So, so in, in that sense, it's nice. What is not so nice about this algorithm is that in order for me to tell you about it, I would first need to give a one hour talk about Aurora's algorithm and I, I don't want to do that. So instead of focusing on that, uh, I will just uh, claim the result a little more precisely and then talk about lower bounds. Okay, so what we showed here is that there is uh, this uh, two to the order one over epsilon times n log n time uh, one plus epsilon approximation for Euclidean TSP uh, in the plane. And uh, actually we show a matching lower bound. So uh, there is no two to the little o of one over epsilon times any polynomial algorithm unless gap ETH fails. So notice that here the lower bound would allow any kind of polynomial factor. Um, uh, so, you know, what, what we are basically claiming is that we have the best possible dependence on one over epsilon uh, up to constant factors in the exponent and under the gap ETH condition. And so this is the two dimensional variant, but also for any fixed D we have the same pair of uh, running time and matching lower bounds. Um, so really quickly, so of course this is randomized. You can de-randomize it just like Aurora's algorithm if you're willing to pay a polynomial factor. So an N to the D factor, um, then uh, you, you get a deterministic algorithm. And in, in terms of gap ETH, it's still 
you know, best possible epsilon dependence. Um, and the algorithm also extends to the Steiner tree problem with some extra work. So um, yeah, those are the nice things. But I think the, the nice thing that I want to tell you about is really uh, this lower bound. Um, so the very interesting thing about the lower bound is that uh, we are using the same lower bound for um, for the exact problem and the approximation problem. By same, I mean that we are using the exact same construction and then we argue about it differently. Okay, so, um, so now we have seen um, like uh, the claims about the algorithms, but I will only talk about the lower bound. And also here, I will not be presenting an actual proof because it, it gets somewhat technical. I will, I will give you an outline and an idea uh, of what is needed in order to achieve such lower bounds. Okay, so I will start with, uh, with something like uh, a satisfiability formula. And I need to I need to make some kind of a reduction. So so I will have a logical formula phi, which will have n variables, and I will make an extra assumption here, namely that each variable should appear at most three times. And also I will have clauses of size at most three, so I also allow clauses of size less than three. Uh, and under these assumptions, actually, uh, satisfy uh, this type of satisfiability still has uh, a, a two to the omega n lower bound under ETH. So so I, I am free to to start with with such a formula. And <clears throat> so based on this formula phi, I want to create a point set of size order n squared, which will have a TSP tour of length x if and only if phi is satisfiable. So I, I don't know off the top of my head what this x will be. Uh, it's not important, but the point here is that given a formula with n variables, I will make a point set of size order n squared where uh, the existence of a tour of a certain length corresponds to phi being satisfiable, right? So this is your, your standard NP hardness reduction. The only extra thing you need to take care of is to make sure that the construction size is not too big. Now, when you are doing uh, approximation algorithms, um, the situation is different. Um, so I, I wrote here roughly what is required. What you need to do is create a point set of polynomial size where tours that are longer than opt by some one plus k epsilon factor should correspond to uh, satisfying assignments in phi. Well, uh, uh, sorry, assignments in phi bar where basically all but uh, constant times k clauses are satisfied, right? So, so I want to proportion the error that I make on my tour, the amount by which my tour is longer, to the number of clauses that I failed to satisfy in phi. Um, and so the interesting thing here, again, is that I will be able to construct one point set that will serve uh, both of these tasks. OK, any questions so far about the plan? OK. OK, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, so how do I, how do I do this? I will start by creating uh, the so-called incidence graph of phi. So it's it's a bipartite graph which has uh, vertices for uh, each variable of phi and uh, vertices for each clause of phi. And because of the fact that uh, I had each variable occur at most three times, uh, and each clause having size at most three, I will have roughly the same number of variables and clauses. So altogether, this graph will have order and vertices. And I will actually draw this graph in uh, in the plane in a manner similar to what you see here. So I will I will use these um, these edges that uh, that go on 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 some uh, fine grid. Okay, and uh, here one of the one of the annoying things is that already if you 
make such a drawing, you will end up with, uh, with quadratically many crossings typically. So when, uh, when I'm creating a, well, I'm, I'm making some kind of gadget reduction, um, I will, I will attempt to, to replace all these vertices in the variables and the closes with some kind of gadgets that uh, somehow represent the function of those things. And we, I, I will also have some kind of point set representing all of these, um, all of these long edges, right? I, I need to carry information between the variables and the closes. And uh, the annoying thing is that already because of these crossings, I will have a construction of size and squared. So, so it, you, you really have to be careful in how you lay this out in the plane to make sure that you're not using too much real estate. And this will become a little bit clearer later on. Okay, so, so I will take this incidence graph and, and now I will, I will introduce some kind of gadgetry in order to represent uh, the function of a variable. Let's say that it can be set only to one of two possible values uh, being true or false. And also, you know, clauses should be, should be, should correspond to some kind of point set, which can be uh, traversed in the shortest possible way, if and only if the clause is satisfied. So this is the type of thing I'm looking for. Okay, and I will not tell you the construction. Uh, just very roughly, it, it uh, proceeds in two stages. So first I took this incidence graph uh, and I can use that layout to create um, a different planar graph, which is now directed and uh, has maximum degree three um, and some other nice properties. And then I will be looking for a Hamiltonian cycle in this planar graph. And this picture that you see here is actually a schematic picture of this planar graph. So for example, you can see that uh, I will have uh, for the variable X1, I, I have like a pair of arcs. Uh, and when I do my Hamiltonian cycle, I will either use this, this top arc or, or this bottom arc to, to go through. And this, these will correspond to setting the variable X1 to true or false. And then I have a copy of the same thing in order to represent the negation of X1. And in order to make sure that this uh, traversal is consistent, I, I will have some kind of X or gadget connecting these two arcs. This, uh, this little blue connector here is representing that. Somehow it will make sure that exactly one of these two uh, top black arcs will be, uh, will be traversed. So basically using, using such X or gadgets, all of these blue connectors here correspond to X or gadgets, you, you, can, you can make sure that uh, the, uh, you have some kind of assignments on, on the variables, which, which is then carried to, to the correct uh, clauses. And then you will need some other type of gadget to, to check the clauses. So you will have like a triple OR and a double OR gadget. And you will also need to do something about all of these crossings. And there is some, some complicated gadget for that as well. I don't want to go into it further, but uh, this is a, like a planar graph. So if I'm talking about a Hamiltonian cycle, then for each edge, either the Hamiltonian cycle will pass through that edge or uh, not use that edge. And this somehow needs to be represented with a point set. And the way it is represented is that for each edge of this planar graph that I have created, I will create some kind of point set, which will be like this width to uh, wiggly grid path, uh, which will somehow represent the function of this edge. And vertices will actually be represented by these little three by three uh, grids. And uh, so, so what, what does an edge do? Well, either I will have a TSP tour that just goes through all of these points and then comes back, or I will have a TSP tour that kind of traverses this, uh, this uh, little uh, grid snake in, in this uh, up and down fashion. Okay. I, I, again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but these will correspond to the Hamiltonian cycle using the edge or not. Anyway, the whole point is that I create a construction of size order n squared, where the construction is actually just 
a subset of an integer grid. Okay, so I have some capital N points. And the interesting property here that we really care about is that my formula fee is satisfiable if and only if there is a TSP tour using only grid edges. And the key thing about an integer grid subset is that the shortest possible distance between points is one. So everything else will have distance at least square root two. Right, so, so the fact that uh, I can traverse uh, using only grid edges will correspond to a TSP tour of length exactly size of the point set. Okay, so this is like an extremely hand wavy uh, something about, about a complicated construction. And I, I, uh, I would say that this type of construction, although you have to be super careful about how you lay it out and make, making sure that uh, the size of this drawing is not too big, if you can do that, then you know you will come out on the other end victorious. The the big problem comes when you want to do something similar in three dimensional space. And here here suddenly you will find yourself out of tools. Okay, so so what kind of thing would I want to prove in the three dimensional case? I want to. Um, uh, I want to prove this uh, two to the little o of n to the two third lower bound for the exact algorithm and uh, this uh, this approximation lower bound for well for the approximation. Um, and suddenly the task is very different. So just concentrating on the three dimensional case instead of making construction of size n squared, now you need to make a construction of size order n to the one point five. And um, really the question is, how can you lay out an incidence graph? Like, like can, can you create a drawing of an incidence graph where, where all the edges are not too close? Because you, if, if, if you have edges that are too close, then, then your gadgetry will, you know, will interact. You want to avoid interactions between different wires. And, um, you still want to keep these wires short. If 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 uh, if you are using a lot of space to do this, then when you are babysitting your your TSP tool to make sure that it is going through these uh, these strange wires, the number of points you are using for that will will grow. So somehow this is a this is a complicated layouting problem. And um, yeah, we were wondering for a while whether this is known how to do this. And uh, yeah, so it's not exactly known. So, so the situation is that you will have some kind of variable gadgets, some kind of closed gadgets. You need to connect them with paths whose total length is short. And these paths shouldn't really interfere with each other. Or put another way, you want to find um, your incidence graph as a topological minor in a grid cube. So we came up with um, with some theorems about uh, minors and topological minors. Okay, so just as a refresher, a graph H is a minor of G if it can be obtained from G by vertex deletions, edge deletions, and edge contractions. And for topological minor, I actually prefer this, this nice way of defining it. So H is topological minor of G if H has a subdivision, which is a subgraph of G. Okay, and basically what we want to do is, is solve this layouting problem, right? I, I give you an incidence graph, show me where I can find it inside the grid cube, and the grid cube should be as small as possible. And once you do that, then I can just take that construction, blow it up a little bit, and use all my gadgets and get a construction for TSP. Am I making sense? So, so what we can prove is the following. There exists a universal constant C such that for any dimension D at least three, 
if you give, give me a graph with m edges and no isolated vertices, then uh, I can find it as a minor of the d-dimensional grid hypercube of side length uh, c times m to the power one over d minus one. Right, so overall the volume of this uh, grid hypercube is going to be like m to the power d over d minus one. It's, it's slightly more than m, but not much more. And actually this is, um, this is tied up to, well, this constant, this unspecified constant factor. And if you prefer topological minors, I can also do it with topological minors. So the story begins the same way. I, I have now an n vertex graph, but here I have to bound the maximum degree, right? Because uh, the grid itself has maximum degree 2D. So if I have an n vertex graph with maximum degree 2D, then I can find it as a topological minor of this grid hypercube of side length C times N to the power one over D minus one. So this we call the strong cube wiring theorem. And uh, this solves this whole layouting issue, right? Because I can just take again my, um, um, my incidence graph and actually these theorems are constructive. So, so you can find these topological minors in, in polynomial time. So given the graph, I can, I can find a, um, uh, a copy of a subdivision of a bound degree graph uh, in discrete hypercube. Once you have that incidence graph sitting there, you can, you can scale everything by a constant factor and put your gadgets into the relevant places of this scaled up construction and uh, just, just get the result you wanted. Um, so I, I believe that this is, uh, this is something really cool. It, 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 um, you know, it solves this layouting problem in, um, in an optimal way. Actually, the variant where the constant depends on, on the dimension is easier to prove, but this, this is not that much harder. Um, so, so yes, I mean, this is kind of the, the structural result that I think is, uh, is interesting and, and is underlying all the lower bounds. Um, and uh, you can, of course, think about uh, similar questions if you are interested in this type of stuff, like uh, trying to find other uh, universal graph families with respect to minors. I, I don't know how much this is done. I certainly saw something uh, like this for uh, expanders. Uh, but, you know, there are other interesting uh, graph classes, like, uh, for example, Hemming cubes and uh, whatnot. Actually, the Hemming cube variant, I can also prove. I just didn't state it here because I haven't found a use for it yet. Um, okay. Go so, ahead. yes? Uh, so, in the st second statement where you have where you have uh, bound in terms of the number of vertices, not number of edges. Yes. You have an extra assumption, yeah? On maximum degree. Of the yes. Uh, do you, is it, is, do you, do you know it's kind of necessary or? Oh, I mean, definitely, right? Because the, the grid that I'm uh, putting this topological minor into has maximum degree 2D, so. Ah, sure, <laughs> of course, okay, That's, thank you. Yes, and, and by the way, so this is where the fact that uh, each variable occurs at most three times comes in also, right? Because uh, uh, the incidence graph has bounded degree, so that's why I can find it as a topological minor. Yes, but uh, you know, if you are okay with uh, with edge, uh, edge contractions also, then you can just use the, the other minor theorem. But for, for these uh, more geometric type of situations, it's usually a no-no. So you will, you will probably need the topological minor variant. Yeah, other questions about these. I, I think, yeah, I, I will not talk much more about these. Um, I want to talk about something else, but uh, I just wanted to, point this out because it's, I think, good to know and, and uh, maybe maybe also good to, to continue researching similar types of results because I think they, they can be useful elsewhere. Okay. 
Uh, if not, then uh, then I move on to, um, oh yeah, this is what I said, that these are constructive. Uh, I, I want to move on to this, um, this more general setting where instead of visiting points, I'm visiting other things. Um, but uh, I also want to bring uh, the Steiner tree into the mix. So the Steiner tree problem, um, well, in a lot of ways, it's a similar problem to TSP. Uh, in a lot of other ways, it is very different. So the general variant, we have an edge weighted graph, and now we're also given some set of terminals, and we want to find the minimum post-connected subgraph covering those terminals. So in this graph with this uh, blue uh, square terminals, the, the optimum would be a tree like this green one. Uh, whereas um, the Euclidean vari variant, I'm again given just n points, and one I want to find the shortest uh, tree that would contain all of these points. And here there is a huge difference. The huge difference between the graph version and the Euclidean version is that in the graph version, you know where these uh, strange connecting points could be, right? You have n vertices in your graph and you know where uh, those points, uh, those Steiner points could be sitting. In the, in the Euclidean version, uh, there is no given set of points where these connection, yeah, I mean, I'm introducing these extra red points, Steiner points, but there's no way to know where they are. Um, and actually, actually, it's a huge problem. So, so there are exponentially ma many possible slots, uh, as in exponential in M, and uh, they, yeah, each construction will will depend, uh, yeah, like the location of these will depend on each other in a in a complicated way. So that makes the Steiner tree problem, the Euclidean Steiner tree, much harder when you want to solve it exactly. Uh, again, we know that the problem is uh, NP complete in the general situation. It's uh, again NP hard in the Euclidean situation. But I have to say here that this NP hardness result is extremely fragile. You try to change one little thing and the whole thing collapses. So this, and it, yeah, it's quite involved. So not like, not like Euclidean TSP at all. When it comes to algorithms, there is of course the famous Dreyfus-Wagner algorithm, the parameterized algorithm, which uh, you would probably want to use if you want to solve Steiner tree. Whereas for the Euclidean variant, the algorithmic development, I would say is still terrible. The best that we can do is to basically look at all kinds of tree structures. So basically I, I want to uh, enumerate all labeled graphs where vertices correspond to either these points or uh, some other Steiner vertices. And once you have such a labeled graph in the abstract without a drawing, there is uh, like a ruler and compass way to, to figure out uh, the corresponding tree if it exists. And you can, you can follow that with an algorithm. So that uh, the ruler and compass construction, it is uh, in fact linear in N. So the, the way the algorithm works is you, you just try every tree structure and um, you, um, uh, you, you check all of them for length and then just spit out the shortest. So as you can see, this is really dumb and, and, and we don't have a sub-exponential algorithm here either. Um, and we don't have any other lower bound other than NP hardness. Um, when it comes to approximation, the, the situation improves a lot. So there is an APX hardness for general Steiner tree and there is a lovely constant approximation uh, for Euclidean Steiner tree. When you allow approximation, suddenly the problem becomes much easier because suddenly you can, uh, you can move your Steiner points to some canonical places. Right? And suddenly you, you have places to put those Steiner points and you can, you can use uh, a lot of other algorithmic techniques uh, once, once you don't have an exponential collection of uh, locations for those Steiner points. So actually the TSP techniques work. Uh, you can get the same running time for the PTAS with uh, a little extra sweat. Um, okay, so that was Steiner tree, but uh, yeah, no matching lower bounds. So there is, there's still a lot to do there. But I, I wanted to move on to this uh, this new and exciting uh, stuff about groups and neighborhoods. 
And this is this is a variant that you might be familiar with. So group Steiner tree is very similar to Steiner tree, but instead of uh, having uh, just k terminals, I have k groups of terminals. And then I want to find the minimum tree which would connect at least one vertex from each group. Okay, and this problem is notoriously difficult, as in we can uh, we can do an order log cube and approximation. Uh, and uh, there is a there's an improvement for that when the underlying graph is a tree to order log squared n approximation. And we actually think that uh, order log squared n is uh, is close to optimum. And uh, well, you can define group TSP in a similar vein, right? I have k groups of vertices and I want to visit uh, at least one vertex from each group. And um, these two problems, group Steiner tree and group TSP, their, their approximation factors are within a factor two of each other, because if you have a good, good uh, Steiner tree, then you can kind of go around the tree and get uh, a TSP solution. And if you have a TSP solution, you can leave out an edge and get a Steiner tree solution. So, so these are, well, up to a factor of two, they are the same. And when we are, we are talking about such terrible approximation situations, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter a factor of two anymore. But this is the, the general setting. I'm interested in the geometric setting. So here, instead of having points, I'm given n sets or regions or objects or neighborhoods. I mean, these, these are just synonyms for the same thing. For some reason, people are calling them neighborhoods. Um, and the goal would be to visit at least one point in each neighborhood. So one nice setting would be that I, I am given these, uh, these uh, orange disks, each one representing one neighborhood. And then I'm looking for the shortest trip or shortest tree to visit all of these, um, all of these disks. So it would look, um, for TSP, it would look something like this maybe. And uh, there is a polynomial time approximation scheme for TSP when these objects are so-called fat, which I am not going to define now, but uh, they, they need to be um, ball-like. So fat is, it basically means it, 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 ha it is roughly ball-shaped and the, uh, the objects also need to be disjoint. And uh, if you think about it intuitively, at least, uh, you know, we could solve this for points and maybe maybe if uh, we have similarly localized things that are disjoint, uh, you know, maybe maybe it is solvable. It, it kind of makes sense to go there. The two dimensional variant was uh, from 2007 and it was, uh, you know, generalized to D dimensions. And also now we can do the same thing in doubling spaces and all kinds of uh, strange uh, other settings. And we also have similar results for uh, Steiner tree now. So I think we, we kind of understand what is happening with fat disjoint objects, but there is a different, uh, and I think kind of natural type of neighborhood to look at, namely affine subspaces, or as they are often called flats. So now I have uh, the D-dimensional Euclidean space and I'm given some K-dimensional affine subspaces or flats. Uh, and I want to find the shortest uh, closed curve that intersects all of these subspaces. So a very simple situation would be in the plane, I'm given a collection of lines and I want to find something that would intersect all of these lines. Like this one. And uh, I, I don't know how yeah, what, what do you think about the difficulty of this problem? What what would you guess? Is this uh, like NP hard or uh, I don't know. So so some, some fun fact about it before, until you were thinking, uh, actually these, um, the points here, they may not be at intersection points of the line. So the points, there are actually instances where, where the, the, the vertices of the optimum tour uh, are all uh, like between intersection points. So they're not intersection points at all. Any tips? Can you repeat your question? 
Yeah, so I mean, what do you think the complexity of this problem is like finding uh, the shortest closed curve intersecting all the lines? In the D dimensions? Or... No, this is just in the plane now. I would guess it's polynomial. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it looks like some kind of a convex hull problem. Yeah, actually, so th that's a good intuition. It is it is similar to a convex hull problem. And indeed, the solution will always be convex. Um, the complication, of course, is that, um, yeah, these these points could be like floating but somewhere between intersection points so so it's it's really difficult to to discretize the problem but indeed in the two-dimensional case with lines we can solve it in polynomial time um there is also um like uh, the steiner tree problem you can you can define it the same way uh solution could look something like this for example um so yeah, I mean, we are we are now starting to explore these problems. Uh, so let's look at the state of the art. Here I have uh, the rows are the, for the underlying space, and uh, the columns correspond to the dimension of the affine subspace. So for for zero dimensional uh, affine subspaces, I'm I'm just looking at points. Uh, so that is uh, that is what we discussed so far. Like we know that there is a polynomial time approximation scheme, but unfortunately the problem is NP hard. And you can uh, you can just take this uh, this top entry in your table, and uh, and use it to prove NP hardness uh, everywhere below this diagonal. But there is this there is this interesting diagonal for the case of the hyperplanes, where the dimension k is equal to d minus one, where that NP hardness result does not apply. Um, so what is known about the rest here? So as, as Bartosz correctly guessed, uh, there is a polynomial algorithm in the case of lines in the plane. And uh, there is an approximation scheme for hyperplanes. But uh, for everything else, the problem seems uh, like, well, we still know very little about it, I would say. Um, I, I will say a, a few things about uh, how these work. So, so the polynomial algorithm has been around now for 20 years. Um, these, uh, this approximation result is interesting. So what happens with lines when the dimension is above two? Um, so one of the, the hard things to do is to discretize the problem again. You don't know where those, where the vertices of your tour might be. So what uh, Dumitrescu and Toad did in 2016 is that they, they found a way to define a point set on each line, a point set of polynomial size, such that uh, the optimum for a group, uh, group DSP or group Steiner tree on those points when when you take these well the points on each line as a group when you when you take those groups and you just just solve uh, group dsp on them you, you will get a constant approximation and uh, with that discretization they just use the ordered log cuban approximation for steiner tree directly like without any any geometry and this is how they got uh, an ordered log cuban approximation um so well, so so one of the downsides, of course, is that you know once once they discretize, they 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 throw out the geometry. So there's there's no reason to believe that this type of approximation is anywhere close to to best possible. Um, and uh, the discretization only works for lines. So if you have other subspaces, then it doesn't work anymore. The PTAS is, is quite recent and uh, well, I I was going to tell you about this, but I, I don't think I will have time. Um, it's uh, it's uh, based on a very nice technique. Um, and okay, we of course have this polynomial algorithm. So maybe maybe one reasonable question is to figure out whether there, there should be a PTAS for, for all of these things in this lower triangle. 
when k is between one and d minus two. And uh, so that we managed to, to answer. Um, so what we showed is that there is uh, like APX hardness for lines in three-dimensional space. Now the inapproximability is really, really close to one. Unfortunately, it's one plus one over 230,000. Uh, but, uh, you know, we know that it is APX hard. And then the same way that you could take the NP-hardness for the points in the plane and, and use that to show NP-hardness for everything else below, you can, you can take this and show that all the remaining cases where a PTAS was not known, there actually does not exist a PTAS unless P is equal to NP. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that, that was uh, kind of an interesting discovery. Actually, you can uh, you can prove the same thing for uh, APX hardness for Stanio tree as well. Like it doesn't follow from this directly, but you can uh, massage the construction. Um, then we have this, uh, this non-theorem <laughs> and yeah, this is um, like an em em embarrassing testament to the way that papers were written in the 90s. So we wanted to prove a polynomial algorithm for Steiner tree uh, with lines in the plane. Like I have a set of lines in the plane. I want to find the, the minimum Steiner tree. And we, we kind of managed to do that modulo a paper from the 90s. And uh, after a long deliberation of several months, we realized that the paper from the 90s is incorrect. So currently we have a, a reduction from Steiner tree to the path DSP problem. So path DSP is, well, the same as DSP, you are just not looking for a closed curve, you're looking for an open curve. Like you, maybe I even tell you which line to start on, which line to end on, and you want to visit all the lines. So that paper in the 90s actually claimed that this is, uh, you know, polynomial time solvable, and uh, yeah, it's incorrect. So we, we have the reduction to that problem, but we do not believe anymore that uh, it can be solved in polynomial time. But what is interesting here, uh, what I want to point out is that um, the reason why this reduction works is because the number of Steiner vertices can be shown to be at most a constant. So this is very different from the point case where you, you might have a linear number of uh, Steiner points. Here you can show that uh, the optimum will have at most two Steiner points. Um, okay, um, and when we, we keep with the hyperplane case, we can actually um, extend the PTAS for, uh, for Euclidean TSP to Steiner tree. And not only that, if you analyze those algorithms properly, it turns out that um, these hyperplane problems are actually easier than the point problems. So the PTAS will be, will be faster for the hyperplanes than for the points. Um, quite surprising, I think. Is there a simple reason why uh, when you have this problem with lines in the plane that uh, that there are only two uh, points, uh, finite points. Is there? Is it easy to see? Because this is no. Oh, okay. Not. Uh, yeah. It's. It's. You. You have to really climb into the structure of of an optimum, and uh, it's nice. That's really wow. Yeah. I mean, we, we were really hoping to you know publish it in some nice place until we realized that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we we are still hopeful that we can in, maybe in some special case uh, we could uh, we could get this uh, this path DSP thing working, but um, not yet. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a couple of slides about that. Um, so, you know, I could uh, I could talk about actually either of these three. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I will say a few words about this uh, this non theorem. <laughs> uh, it 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 might be um, one of the more interesting ones. And there is a good story behind it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so let me let me skip the pitas for the hyperplanes, and uh, my first conclusion to go to 
uh, to go to this thing. So what is happening here? I want to visit lines in the plane and there is of course, uh, you know, the TSP question and the Steiner J question and they are, they are a little bit related in a weird way. So for the TSP, we can, uh, you, you know, if you sit down uh, for two minutes, you can, you can prove that the optimum is going to be convex. And uh, the, the, a nice way to think about this is uh, to take, uh, you fix some reference point O on your tour. Of course, this point is unknown, but let's just fix it anyway for now. And uh, for each uh, line, I take the half plane uh, bounded by that line, which does not contain O. Okay, and now instead of thinking of this problem as visiting lines, I can think of it as visiting these half planes. And uh, I could uh, like look at these half planes and uh, and uh, index them in uh, clockwise order of their normal vectors. Okay, so so these half planes are are ordered according to their normals, and here is like the key claim that that makes this whole thing solvable. What you can prove is that um, there are points uh, pi in half plane. H i uh, such that these points occur in gamma in the order of their indices. And here I'm talking about cyclic order. So what is happening is that um, these half planes, I can think of uh, them as being visited in order of their indices. Um, um, okay, I mean, maybe I... I don't want to actually prove this. Um, okay, to, to appreciate this claim, so so this uh, this assignment of points in the half planes intersection gamma is it is not not trivial. So some of these points pi will so so some intervals of this pi will uh, will collapse to a single point, um, but still. And the fact that that you can create such an ordering means that uh, this this becomes like a, like an ordered problem where you know uh, where to go next, right? If I have visited H one, then okay, now I need to visit H two, and now I need to visit H three. So, so somehow somehow this is what makes the whole thing work. Um, so once once you have such a fixed order, there is uh, there is this other nice notion of local optimality versus global optimality. So when you are at one spot, visit some line and go to some other spot, uh, there's actually uh, a unique best way to do that, namely to to go through this point that you would get by you know reflecting one point on the line and connecting the two points right when when the angles are the same this will be the way to go from A to B that would minimize this length and visit the line. So this is kind of this, this local property that has to be true everywhere. And what turns out is that as long as you have a fixed order and you have local optimality, uh, basically it implies global optimality. So this is what was observed in 2003. Now this is for TSP. For Steiner tree, there is, uh, you know, something else going on. Like uh, you could have um, like several things, uh, so several edges meeting at one vertex, and then you can you can change that point. You can move that point into the Torricelli point of this triangle, where these angles are the same, um, and that would minimize the sum of these three edges. And you also have these. Um, these type of visits where a leaf of your Steiner tree is going to some line and then you, you want to make sure that it is uh, perpendicular. So unfortunately, you know, there is not quite the same notion of order for a Steiner tree as for a TSP. There is something quite similar, but not the same. And um, I, I, I cannot prove the analog of this local optimality implies global optimality statement. So 
um, yeah, this I, I actually don't want to go into because I have taken up already an hour, but uh, roughly uh, what is happening here is that, uh, you know, the, the, way, the way this 2003 paper is written for TSP is that I'm given a starting point and then I'm given a sequence of polygons, convex polygons, and I want to visit all of these polygons in this sequence starting from S. And uh, this is pretty much the same problem. Uh, just we are just uh, using these half planes instead of these polygons to do the visit. Uh, the issue is, of course, that this relies on knowing a starting point. And as I said, it is possible to have a solution where you don't know the starting point. So there is there is a whole whole other drama about this particular case to solve, but you know it can be solved. I, I will again not go into it. Um, yes, anyway. So we, with Steiner tree, uh, the situation is, is uh, you know, slightly different. Uh, what you can do is um, you can again assign these points P1, P2, P3, and so on in the order of uh, uh, like, I, I have the same half planes. Um, I can assign points pi in the intersection of the tree and the hi. And what I can prove is that if I go around this plane drawing of the tree, then these pi's will appear in the same, well, in, in increasing order of indices. Right, so instead of thinking of it as a tree, I think of it as this, this doubled curve. And along this curve, the PIs will appear in order. Um, okay, and then, uh, you know, uh, I, would, I would go into something called visitation ranges. So it has to do for, for, for each edge of this, Steiner tree, I can define um, a range. So basically an arc of the unit uh, circle uh, that will correspond to uh, like the range of the normals that I will visit in that subtree. And uh, using these visitation ranges, you can, uh, well, you can, you can prove some, some nice lemmas. Like uh, uh, for example, the if, if I have an edge uh, UV, then um, the vector uv will be contained in the visitation range of the subtree of v um, and, and some other you know structural results so yeah this is actually what i was saying um, and then yeah I, I i don't even have the slides but uh, you know some some further structural insights will will give you this this bound of two steiner vertices so you're talking about ancestral predecessor relation. Uh, how do you root the tree? Um, anywhere. So the visitation range for the root is just the whole circle. And uh, yeah, I, I don't have the time or or slides to to really uh, you know explain this, uh, but. You know these, these visitation ranges basically um, you can prove that they are pretty wide because when you have a Steiner vertex uh, what you have is uh, you def by definition have a this storage alley point with 120 degrees everywhere so what that means is that if you have a Steiner vertex it will kind of occupy a lot of space in in the visitation ranges and what you can show is that if you have two points that are not in ancestor descendant relationship, then the sub their, their subtrees will have these joint visitation ranges. So if you have too many these large disjoint visitation ranges, then they just don't fit on the unit circle anymore. So this is this is kind of the way that uh, the Steiner vertex bound is proven. Um, Uh, anyway, um, so based on this, you can you can 
pretty much uh, use like geometric tricks to reduce your problem to to a past TSP instance, somehow somehow getting rid of um, these uh, Torricelli points. But uh, you still end up with a past TSP instance, and unfortunately, we don't know how to solve that. There was uh, this extremely complicated dynamic programming proposed for it, which just we don't believe works. Okay, so maybe I will go back to, to my actual, well, I go back to my conclusion. <laughs> um, so what we have seen today, uh, so in general for TSP, uh, you know, we already know a lot about what kind of algorithms and uh, approximation algorithms can be done and, and we, we understand the lower bounds pretty well. Um, the real questions I think still remain with uh, with Euclidean Steiner tree, especially with the exact version. So here really the complexity skyrockets because of these uh, these unknown Steiner points. There is, uh, I think, still a lot to, to understand with those. Um, then there was this, uh, you know, excited question about uh, trying to look at, uh, you know, other uh, visiting other things than points like lines or uh, um, or affine subspaces. And we, we have uh, some nice technique uh, for doing so, uh, like pitasis for the hyperplane case. But uh, really, there are no lower bounds there. We don't even know whether the problem is NP hard. So if I give you a set of planes in three dimensional space and I tell you to visit those planes uh, with the shortest possible closed curve, I don't know if this problem is NP hard or not. In principle, you know, there could be uh, like a fully polynomial approximation scheme, something that is polynomial also in one over epsilon, maybe. I, I cannot rule this out. And I, I, here I mean that, okay, I would be a little bit surprised if this is possible, but you know, it's not out of the question, given that the, the current PTAS technique is more efficient than the one for points. Um, yeah, so even 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 with such an algorithm, it may be NP hard still. Um, and when it comes to, you know, not hyper not hyperplanes and not points, there is a huge gap in our understanding. So we have this this uh, extremely weak approximation, uh, like order log cube n, and our in, in approximability is is like extremely close to one. So that there's a huge gap in what the, the best approximation factor is going to be. We, we have really no clue and uh, a lot of ground to explore there. So um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you for listening.